Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the New Model Advisor podcast. Today, like any respectable financial publisher, we will be talking about Lego. Now, not necessarily about playing with it or even the bitter pain of treading on it, but instead about its value as an alternative investment. As is often the case, I'm joined by our magazine editor, Oliver Smith. I, myself, am Ian Horn, at least I was the last time I checked. And joining us today is Sava Shanaev, who co-authored the academic paper, Children's Toy or Grown-Ups Gamble, Lego Sets as an Alternative Investment. Sava, firstly, hello. Hi. Good to have you here. Good to have you with us. Uh, and secondly, your paper's about Lego. Tell us about it. Right. So... Basically, um, I'm a PhD student at Northumbria University. I'm a lecturer there, so finance research is basically my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And obviously, just cracking data on stock indices that like hundreds of people have looked at before me so sort of becomes boring. And my initial area of research was on stock market anomalies, so those weird effects that are noticed, are spotted on markets all over the world, and no one can explain it first. So we can look at like Monday effect, Friday effect, stocks stocks underperforming on Mondays, outperforming on Fridays. There are even uh, more sophisticated ones now. There are like uh, literally hundreds, like size effect, small firms, small caps outperforming large caps. There are There is a huge industry. There are loads of funds that try to exploit that. But from an academic point of view, it's very important to sort of get a glimpse of whether this is a robust effect, whether this effect is true, um, if it's not just a blip in the data, whether just, I mean, humans really imagine stuff all, all the time. So what I try to look at is to try to spot those effects on fringe markets that no one has looked at before me. So that's why I do a lot of research on crypto, and that's why this paper is about Lego. To be fair, I think this is just the second academic paper on Lego uh, anyone has ever written. Uh, the motivation for it was, uh, I mean, first of all, as pretty much any kid in my generation, I was a huge fan of Lego growing up. Um, and second, um, my mate just approached me once and said, oh, Sava, have you seen this huge secondary market for Lego? There is a website mm. that's solely dedicated yeah, to yeah. Lego trading. And there are price quotes, there are volume quotes. You can see where the money goes from, where the money com comes in. So it's sophisticated, then. It's a really sophisticated thing. Yeah, there is there is a whole market for that, and apparently Lego is a quite a valuable collectible nowadays. This is particularly pertinent because uh, for two reasons. Firstly, because I recall something on Twitter last year about how uh, informed choice financial planning managing director Martin Bamford, mm -hmm. himself a podcast hero, had been trading Lego sets. I think. And I think doing quite well at it, actually. But also at our uh, retreat uh, this year in September, we had uh, a former Lego executive uh, on stage talking to our audience about how uh, Lego had identified a problem with its brand and they'd adapted its uh, product offering and expanded its uh shall we say, compatibility um, with its marketplace to, to basically boost, boost sales and boost profits. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating chat. So I think... There's no better time to be discussing this. What 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 have you found as a result of your your studies? I mean, is there anything that, that is actually remarkable here? Right. So just to provide like a quick brief, we're actually building up, um, not building up, but pretty much criticizing the hell out of a previous study on Lego. So okay. the only the only one that came before us, which was actually covered in Bloomberg Markets, weirdly enough, like last year. So this topic is quite it's picking up quite quite fast so uh basically what this research established is that they investigate the smaller sample they investigated lego trading on ebay rather than mm. on this specialized secondary market platform and they found that uh annual lego return returns um if you just buy lego sets at retail price and hold them and then look at how your portfolio holdings change over time that those annual returns were around 8% per annum in real terms, so mm. adjusted for inflation. Yeah, And this is quite a lot. Um, I've done a lot of like studies on alternative investments. And if you look at wine, if you look at stamps, if you look at precious metals or diamonds, 
pretty much the consensus is that the return is sort of around two to four percent, which is um, a good figure for a defensive investment. This is another thing. Most of alternative investments and what makes them attractive at first is that they exhibit like very, very attractive diversification and hedging opportunities. Mm. They are not exposed to any sort of overall market risk. If S&P or FTSE 50 tanks, then Lego or wine or stamps, they just don't care. And this is like a diversifier. Um, so this is like the initial diversification benefit. But they actually claimed that Lego can outperform um, S&P 500 pretty much over a long period of time while also being virtually risk-free. And mm. uh, that what, that's what caught my attention. And uh, when my, my friend just said, well, there is this huge database, let's investigate that. Um, I was just, all right, I'm on it. Uh, and also I remembered this childhood experience of mine. In 2001, the biggest Lego set was this Harry Potter Hogwarts castle, the original Hogwarts castle. Yeah, oh, I remember that. And uh, yeah. we all remember that. We all crave. <laughs> I, I, I believe, like, if we are in the right age, we all crave for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, its God. retail price was around eighty quid. And if you look at this trading platform, then currently it's trading at four hundred and fifty, and it's ten percent per annum. And I was looking at this set, and I was just like, "All right, I was quite a good investor at the age of five, I guess." <laughs> yeah. Um, so where's your set is, now, hmm? so where, Where's the set now? Is it uh, still intact or is it in pieces in yeah, a charity yeah, shop? Box it. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I could know better as a five-year-old kid. I mean, that's one way to so, diversify an investment, to stick it in several different boxes across charity shops all over the country <laughs> without real, any real control. Um, it'd be quite hard to reassemble that as, a, <laughs> as an asset. Um, can we just talk about risk? Oh, sure. You're saying, you know, there was this sort of... Uh, uh, potential for it to be, you know, supposedly risk-free. I mean, what are the risks? I mean, if you're sort of a Lego obsessee and you and you, you know, want to buy this stuff, uh, what are the risks specific to that niche? Because I think, yeah. you know, if financial advisors had clients that maybe had some wine on the side, or you know, a collection like this, or you know, Hornby train sets or something, it wouldn't be their main, you know, it wouldn't be their main holding. It would be very simply a bit on the side that provided potentially uh, some liquid cash if needed, uh, you know, in a rainy day or if they just got bored one day, then they might have a few, you know, thousand pounds more than they otherwise would have done. What are the risks of investing in Lego? Is there anything specific to Lego? Yeah, and actually, just have before you jump in, can I, can I add on to that question, actually? Because I remember going back again to our childhoods. Um, well, I'm about 31. You guys might be a bit younger than me. But I remember um, Beanie Babies coming out and people looking at those and, you know, the projected prices. And people said, oh, yeah, well, in 10 years' time, this one's going to be worth 1 million or 500,000. They were stupid inflated prices. Obviously, they, they just lost value. I don't think they ever came close to those valuations. Um, so as well as, you know, what are the risks of Lego, how is Lego different from other similar commodities, if you were to, you know, classify yeah. them as such? Pokemon cards, et yeah. uh, Two... Absolutely great questions. So to answer yours first, Ali, um, the risks are very different from the uh, risk profile that we observe on the traditional markets. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like market risk, like beta, like the, the most common measure of sort of market risk, then there is nothing like that in Lego. But what is there is, and this is actually a good translation into Beanie Babies, um, this is <laughs> words that have never been spoken yeah. in the studio. <laughs> I think you safely say that. <laughs> uh, there is uh, this theory, which is quite complicated, but I'll, I'll try to basically make an elevator pitch. Um, so, which is called uh, consumption asset pricing model. Uh, basically, what it states is that if a particular investment is correlated with consumption, so if asset value is correlated with consumption, then it will uh, demonstrate some very, very wild dynamic mm. that's going to be different mm. from the market overall. So, and alternative investments such as wine or whiskey or cars, um, and we can talk about Beanie Babies and Lego as well, uh, they fall into this weird category as they're both a consumable and an asset class. So that they demonstrate this weird idiosyncratic so very, very um, unique, um, unexplainable by anything else, dynamic, that they are sensitive to consumption patterns and consumer sentiment, basically. 
And this is what can explain, like one of the reasons that can explain um, the Beanie Babies bust. Uh, but Beanie Babies are very, very different from Lego in terms of the business model of the company, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So um, to provide an easy example, uh, Lego had a competitor called Megablocks. Oh, yeah. And uh, actually, <laughs> as a kid, I liked Megablocks quite a lot more because they had those like medieval themes, dragons, castles, and they were like grim and cool and very, very manly. Me as like a, <laughs> me as like a seven-year-old, five-year-old kid. Um, I mean, it really appealed to me. Um, but why ultimately Lego took off as an alternative investment and Megablocks didn't is that Lego has a very, very formal and very, very um, well-developed identification system. Mm. So Lego, each Lego set has a unique number. Mm. Uh, Lego sets are very, very difficult to forge as mm. they have like serial numbers and you can basically track them to a particular series, to a particular like year of launch, even uh, in some cases to a particular factory when mm. they were manufactured. While Mega Blocks didn't really care about that. And uh, that's why we're now talking about Lego, not Mega Blocks, mm. unfortunately, uh, to my sentimental view. <laughs> um, and <laughs> forgery is something that's very, very, that's, that plagues alternative investments um, mm. overall. Yeah. Uh, wine, for example, uh, or paintings. Um, selling um, a bottle of wine or a painting. Coins. Uh, coins as well. Yeah. Coins as well can be. Coins. So uh, with Beanie Babies, what was one of the main problems is high risk of forgery mm -hmm. because they were not as protected against replicas yeah. as Lego is. Yeah. So you as a seller of a Beanie Baby uh, couldn't basically uh, persuade your purchaser that this is genuine. Mm -hmm. So market for lemons. Um, if you know, like as, uh, information asymmetry, when there is no, um, there is no commitment to your product being genuine, the, there will be no liquid market for that. I mean, there's quite a few issues to unpack here. One of them is, you know, what you're talking about effectively is a market monopoly from a particular company that has, you know, very smartly assembled uh, a, a unique offering. Um, if we're talking about kind of consumption-led growth, um, that's inextricably itself connected to supply, and that's connected to you know potential monopoly. I mean, that's quite a virtuous circle for a, a company like Lego. I mean, what would happen, say, in some alternative universe where Lego suddenly went bust because of some accounting scandal or you know cor poor corporate governance? I mean, presumably the value of the value of all these sort of sets in on the um, on the uh, trading sites would would absolutely rocket, right? Oh. Or is that is, or, or would it? Well, it's a really, really good question. And uh, it depends on basically which of the two effects would prevail. Yeah. There's obviously the effect of limited supply. Yeah. That there is basically a guarantee that there would never be another set of Lego. But there is a reputational effect mm. um, as you're holding a, uh, a product, basically, an asset class. Yeah generated by a company that's got involved in a scandal. Yeah, yeah. That's going to negatively affect the price. Yeah. And basically, the supply limiting factor is already there, as LEGO has a very, very neat policy in terms of um, discontinued sets. Mm. Uh, if we return back to the Hogwarts castle, um, there is actually uh, a Hogwarts castle that's currently being sold in shops. And its retail price is £73. Um, I saw it yesterday at my local Tesco. Um, there's this large one. Uh, extra, I think. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not a bit, though, yeah. Uh, details, Sam, <laughs> details. Uh, and uh, it's lower than the initial retail price of uh, £80 pounds yeah, for the yeah. 2001 yeah. Um, set. But it's different. Uh, it's doesn't, it, it is not a perfect substitute. No. It doesn't have that much of a collector value. And presumably it's smaller and all. Um, no, it's actually the same size. Ooh. It's slightly different. I mean, uh, the blocks are slightly different. The arrangement of the rooms in the castle are different. Mm. Uh, but, well, it's still a Hogwarts castle. If you were to buy a Hogwarts castle to your kid, then probably they, were not, they wouldn't care. But Lego has this policy of weirdly uh, altering the design of the toys mm. from time to time, so that Every single series 
is unique. Yeah. The most common example would be if you remember old Lego sets that were manufactured before 2003, uh, all minifigures had yellow skin. And I mean, we can say that's quite offensive and stuff, but uh, well, it's a collectible. It's a it's a collectible value. After that, uh, most uh, Lego minifigures had pink skin. They were pink. So they just rebranded how they were doing their minifigures. Mm -hmm. And that was partly to distinguish older sets from newer sets and pump up, pump up the collector value of older sets. And uh, don't, don't get me wrong, Lego doesn't care about collectors. I was about to ask. It cares about, it cares about um, well, it's sort of the same thing as uh, planned, planned obsolescence, mm. but from a different point of view. Uh, like, you know how Apple issues a new iPhone every single year, pretty much. Yeah. So that rubbish. there is... <laughs> They're rubbish. They are. It's, it's tech dumping. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is just a business strategy that they try to induce demand uh, in their customers who have a perfectly functionable, functional iPhone mm. and they just want a new one. So in terms of Lego, when they rebrand a particular line of sets, for example, Harry Potter, then kids see new sets, yeah. and they can be very, very similar to those that they own, but, well, as a parent, try to explain to your kid that, that well, you already have a very similar set. No, 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 mom, you, daddy, I want, I want this one, the, the new one. So this is actually the incentive structure for Lego, and it is actually what proved very, very important for its value as a collectible. Mm -hmm. well, I've got a slightly different question on that. I mean, it's interesting how Lego kind of keeps its value and stays valuable. Um, but I suppose what I want to know is how much you think Lego's value is tied up in its cultural relevance? Because, you know, we've heard the inside story of Lego. I think a lot of people know that they started out, you know, Mega Bloks would have been the rival. But now they're computer games. They're yeah. all sorts of tie-ups for, you know, films. other brands, films, the whole lot. So Great question. You know, do you think if it lost its cultural relevance, do you think the value of Lego would, would plummet? Uh, well, that was exactly the point I was making before. If Lego goes bust, then it loses this sort of sentimental bit of value. Mm. And actually, one of, the, um, one of the estimations, one of the tests I make in the paper is I try to determine whether there is uh, a sentimental value in holding Lego apart from its basically risk-return profile. Mm. And it turns out there is. So at least some investors do hold Lego because they like holding Lego, not because they think that it's going to appreciate in the future. So it's not this um, virtue circle, vicious circle, or mm. bubble, how you might want to call it. Uh, some of it, at least, is genuine sentiment. And that might vanish if Lego goes out of business mm. or Lego uh, is no longer positioning itself with movies and video games and that type of stuff. So that's an absolutely valid valid point. And I just wanted to make another point about uh, comparing Lego and uh, Beanie Babies. Uh, <laughs> uh, because like, actually, it, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to compare the two cases and uh, try to determine why the one failed and the other succeeded, or at least succeeds as for now. Mm. Um, Beanie Babies were around in the 90s, where, uh, and they coincided with the dot-com bubble, weirdly enough, but... Uh, and in the 90s, uh, the marketplace for Beanie Babies was very, very fragmented. You could see uh, transactions occurring basically over the counter, if we use technical jargon, uh, with like single trades occurring between different counterparties, different collectors, different enthusiasts. And you could see the same Beanie Baby, for example, uh, Princess Diana, uh, being sold at a very, very high price dispersion. Wait, there was a Princess Diana Beanie Baby? Yeah. Ash wasn't aware of that either. Oh my God. That, wa that was one of the... This I mean, world is going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they exploited the hype. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite vicious of them, to be fair. Wow. Um, I mean, this was a special issue. Yeah, mm. they wanted to ride the hype. Mm. Uh, but still, uh, this was one of the most high, highly demanded... Beanie Baby? Was there a Prince Charles one and a, a Liz one and a... 
Uh, no. Yeah, no. Should we carry on with the royal family? Because we'd go horribly wrong at this point. Uh, in time. I believe she was the only member of the royal family who made it into a beanie baby. Okay, well, that was a smart decision. <laughs> um, agree, yeah. So, and as the market was very, very uh, poorly structured, and um, sellers and buyers didn't really know about each other, uh, there are records of the Princess Diana beanie baby being sold uh, in a matter of days or months mm-hmm. at. Ten dollars for one investor, a hundred dollars for another investor, and a thousand dollars for a third investor, as it was really, really hard to coordinate, um, basically enthusiasts and investors. Yeah, sure. uh, and actually, what like a bid ask spread of a thousand percent? Well, like, mm-hmm. come on. And is that why Lego has been more successful because its appeal is much more universal? I mean, it's interesting that you talk about a cultural relevance because I think one of the things that you know, for instance, the Lego movie tapped into was this escapism that Lego facilitates. So it's escapism from this kind of, uh, from all the woes and problems of the outside world. And uh, I wouldn't, I mean, this is a, a rad question, but if, if say, for instance, uh, the world becomes so unbearable that escapism is no longer possible, I mean, is Lego likely then to drop in value? I mean, how does it, that must be part of its strategy to try and maintain that universal appeal to so many people who can escape rather than just, you know, one country that might be a massive family of the royal, you know, massive fan of the royal family or one, you know, country that, that isn't, for instance. There's universality there, isn't there? Uh, well, first of all, if the world becomes really unbearable, then Lego value plummeting is should be the least of your concerns, I guess. But what about my investments, Sam? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, if the world becomes really unbearable, then, well... Um, stocks also going to plummet, I guess. Yeah. And also, like, in terms of escapism, um, I guess that's uh, a theme that governs a lot yeah. uh, in the modern world. Yeah. Like, um, social media, uh, people just yeah. spending hours and hours online uh, in yeah. online games. Um, I mean, Office is real life, at least, yeah. arguably. Um, Not if you work with Ian. <laughs> it's a dream. Uh, academia, it's a dream. <laughs> academia can be also considered a, uh, a form of escapism. Yeah. yeah. So, um, true. And given the fact that Lego uh, is sometimes collected for solely sentimental purpose by grown-up people, uh, it's very, very uh, famous, a very, very famous fact mm. that uh, there is a guy in Czech Republic who is one of the has one of the largest uh, collections of Lego, and some of the rare sets, uh, he has a unique example, the only example left that has been um, unboxed, that hasn't been unboxed. Mm. And that's why, like, if you look at how Lego is traded across countries, you'll have this very, very weird hub in Czech Republic. Mm. It's just because of this one this one guy. Could because he's driven as he's single handedly driven the price and the value of Lego up. Oh no, no, not 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 by any chance. He <laughs> represents like maybe five percent of the market. Okay. Mm, That's still I quite a lot. <laughs> uh I mean it's hard to uh calculate that because transactions are not I mean you can't get personal data of yeah. Uh, obviously, for eth- ethical reasons, of people who are undertaking the transactions. But if you look at transactions in Czech Republic, then um, it's it's a lot. But it's not not the fact that this guy is the ultimate orchestrator of the Lego boom. No. Okay. Well, here's another question. Actually, so we were talking about types of beanie babies, even, uh, and also with Lego. You talked about the Hogwarts castle and a few other things. You know, having studied it. What type? Say, say if I want to buy Lego as an investment rather than for fun, mm-hmm. what types of Lego should I be buying? Uh, that's a really good question because not all Lego sets are created equal in terms of performance. And at this point, we should say that CityWire Financial Publishing does not endorse any advice or guidance to buy specific Lego <laughs> sets. And we do Correct. not take any responsibility for any valuation increase or decrease that happens thereafter. <laughs> Thanks, Ollie. Um, so, <laughs> We're very serious uh, having said that, um, a reasonable disclaimer, uh, having said that... Um, there is a very, um, very notable pattern that small sets, so we measure it as sets that have low volume, so dimensions, mm-hmm. uh, length by width by height, um, those sets um, do show 
uh, significantly higher higher returns over the years, then uh, and this is like exactly like size effect, like small firm effect on the on the stock market, where small caps outperform the the large caps, the blue chips. Then there is the Lego value effect, that value sets just as value stocks outperform growth stocks. Well, what the heck is the value Lego set? Uh, we measure it as retail price to piece ratio. So each Lego set, and again, uh, Lego is so picky that every single set has a piece count, mm -hmm. has weight, standardized weight, mm -hmm. standardized dimensions. So if you divide the initial retail price to the number of pieces, you'll get this estimate of how much are you of Lego, how much of good old plastic, mm -hmm. basically, are you getting for your buck? Yeah. And uh, the sets that have uh, low price-to-piece ratios, so value sets, also tend to outperform. Uh, there is also, obviously, um, the effect regarding the year of launch, and uh, I call this the Lego yield curve. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, Another so neologism. Online, by the way. It is. Yes. How can people find it? Um, so my my paper. Mm. Mm. Oh, obviously it's available in SSRN, mm. and uh, it is available in the conference proceedings of Seventeenth uh, Finance Risk and Accounting Perspectives Conference. Ah, yes, I know that well. <laughs> uh, is it on Bookmark. JSTOR? Is it? Uh, it is uh, elsewhere. Uh, okay. Oh, elsewhere yeah, sorry, yeah. is yeah. almost open access. Okay. So even uh, our uh, audience who are not members of academia, and I believe 99% of them aren't, uh, you can still access it on SSRN, mm. because SSRN is completely open access. Yeah. That is what it's created for. And um, Elsphere is also almost open access. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, so I interrupted you on the Lego yield yeah, curve. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should not have done that. Please, please do tell us more. So, about the Lego yield curve, um, there is this also a very, very robust effect, a very, very well, well no noticed effect, that older sets have higher returns. And, I mean, this is just as uh, bonds of higher maturity have higher yield. Yeah. And uh, that can be, uh, again, interpreted as liquidity premium. Well, if you hold sa a set for 30 years, then you should be rewarded for that. Yeah, and you, even shoulder, from a, you shoulder the risk. Okay. Even from a, from a moral perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is the liquidity effect. Um, and then uh, I also... Um, undertook the analysis in terms of themes and topics. So, again, all LEGO sets are ranked based on broad themes, So, uh, and there are like around 20 of them, and there are specific topics. For example, Harry Potter is a topic, mm. and uh, construction or architecture is a theme. So, in terms of themes, uh, construction, architecture, and collectible minifigures are the most valuable, the most well-performing sets. Mm. Uh, they deliver around 4% uh, per annum value-weighted, while adjusted for all kinds of survivorship bias effects. Mm. So it's very, very robust. You always get this effect. And I can talk about survivorship bias in a minute if you're if you are interested. It's quite technical, but... Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, on, so. give, us the, uh, give us the basics of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 the elevator pitch regarding survivorship bias. Um, imagine that you are investigating the um, return, um, returns of Lego sets, of whole Lego sets. You are sort of simulating an investment strategy when an investor doesn't know much, and they just invest in all Lego sets, they buy all of them, all of them that are available at retail price and hold. So if you only account for the sets that are currently traded on the market, then you would obviously have a biased calculation because some of the sets are not traded on the market. Well, why? Maybe because no one cares about them. And the survivorship bias is very, very important when you study performance of different asset classes. Mm -hmm. With, even with stocks, you have to account for stocks that have been delisted, that have gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. For wine, um, if we talk about alternative investments, uh, for wine, survivorship bias is also a very, very important thing, as uh, those high-profile collectibles are traded at auctions with reserve prices. Mm -hmm. And if no one wants to pay for this bottle of wine or for this painting more than the reserve price, then it never goes in the box. 
So that what makes the estimation very, very hard. That what makes really making sense of how well those alternatives are performing um, extremely difficult. And that's what arguably uh, our predecessors, the authors of the first paper, missed. Mm -hmm. um, that they just um, calculated the returns based on the sets that were traded on eBay. Yeah, and so they didn't we, have a full picture. Uh, they didn't have a full picture. Obviously, uh, we can't claim to have an absolutely full picture as well. No. But we make reasonable assumptions about what to do with sets that are not currently traded. Mm. Have they lost all of their value? Yeah. Can you st still sell them at some low uh, recovery price? Yeah. Uh, or do you just assume that they haven't uh, appreciated at all and you can value still value them at their retail price? Mm. So that's that's basically the gist. And we, we've done the calculations based on different assumptions. And um, again, returning to set-specific, like theme-specific, topic-specific performance, um, architecture, construction, and uh, uh, collectible figures are the three themes that basically rock it, that uh, have returns of higher than 4% mm -hmm. per annum. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I have one more question for you, Salva. It's not specifically Lego-related. So, Oli, if you've got anything more Lego to ask... Please well, so. I mean, I just wondered if I could ask you about this issue of risk again, because I know that um, as the kind of Greta Thunberg effect continues and the, the need to protect the environment and sort of offset, um, you know, our carbon footprints continues to stamp its way into our consciousness that Lego being a predominantly plastic based product uh, has to do something. And they've uh, I don't know the full details of it, but they've certainly made efforts to that effect by changing the material from which the sets are made from. I mean, does that present a risk to it as an asset class, the sustainability element in any way? Are we going to talk about the carbon risk of Lego? We are, we are going into a I mean, deep, this deep could be house. This could be part two of the podcast, but I mean, you know, uh, is, oh, is that, a, is that a, a, a viable uh, risk? I think that given the framing of Lego, uh, no one really thinks about Lego as a company that's um, that's having a high carbon footprint. Yeah. As what we see are colorful toys. Yeah. Well, that's the power of brand, isn't it? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Like when you think about carbon footprint, you always um, think about like BP oil spill or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You think about like those energy companies, and they're portrayed very, very viciously by the media, and that they have very, very like negative, sentimental portrait in the collective psyche. Uh, Lego, as still it might be produced from plastic and it might um, adversely affect the environment, it might. But uh, ultimately, um, only the information that investors, that humans acknowledge is reflected in the price. Ian, yes, I have one last question because we are sadly almost out of time. But, you know, before we started recording, you were talking about how you've had a significant amount of interest from people wanting to talk to you about, about Lego now. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to know what's next. Um, are you going to study something else that's kind of pop culture specific or something, you know, something similar? Have you got another study planned? Uh, so currently I'm focusing on cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. as um, I myself um, hold cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you? Yeah, I do. How, how much have you got? Uh, so, well, well, first of all, which cryptocurrency are you spread across? You know, uh, uh, so Bitcoin, uh, I, I, I'm a sort of a Bitcoin maximalist. Okay. Which is an unpopular opinion, okay. um, and I also try to uh, wrap my head around the Bitcoin Cash hard fork last November, um, and uh, made some money out of it. Basically, with cryptocurrencies, uh, what I do is that, I mean, it's also research. Uh, ob obviously, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> obviously, um, obviously, there are valuation techniques for a lot of um, conventional asset classes. Yeah. Like for bonds, you just discount the coupons, discount cash flows at a reasonable discount rate. For stocks, you can apply fundamental analysis, valuation multiples, um, discount dividends if you'd like. So there are valuation techniques that can assign a price, a fair value, to the instrument that you are trading. For cryptocurrencies, it was very unclear what is that. And the field is still trying to wrap its head around what the valuation framework for cryptocurrencies should be. 
And uh, I developed, it was almost a year ago, and I developed a model that was valuing Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin was trading at $3,800 back in the day. And my model said that it should be valued at uh, over 6000 And uh, I was like, all right, I I'll, I'll shall put my money where my mouth is. And I bought Bitcoin and decided to hold it until it reaches 6000 And it did. And that's what I basically do with Bitcoin. I apply this model mm. and uh, try to uh, buy it when it's undervalued according to my model and sell yeah, it when yeah. it's overvalued according to my model. Mm. Um, well... I don't know how interesting that might be. Well, uh, yeah, well, if he keeps making money, then so far so good. Um, I'm sure people always be interested in that. Well, a resurgence of the value investing mm. uh, approach. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that is sadly all we have time for. But Sava, thank you. That was fascinating. Great insight into, into Lego as an asset class. Uh, I'd never looked at it that way before. But um, yeah, I mean, that was really, really insightful. Yeah, thanks, so, mate. so thank you. And, and yeah, thanks, Mr. Molly. Uh, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.